Well, happy Easter. I hope you've had a great week and looking forward to, to Sunday services and where we celebrate, celebrate the resurrected Lord. And uh, today's we're, we're not in Psalms this, this week. We're, we're over in Luke chapter 24. So we're going to go there. Um, Buddy Hook shared something on Facebook this week that uh, he got it from somewhere else, but he shared it anyway. I thought it was very good. It says, Death of Christ was proof that Jesus really was human. But the resurrection was proof that He is God. I like that. Uh, That's great. But um, ever since Christ's resurrection, men have tried to deny that there was ever a physical resurrection. Uh, This position begins began because of one event in history, and that is the religious leaders of Jesus' day bribed the Roman soldiers to say His disciples had stolen His body. So, where does that leave us today? Do we believe or not believe in the physical resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ? Actually, I look back on last year's... my notes from last year's Easter lesson and Josh Josh McDowell once said the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the most wicked vicious heartless hoax ever imposed upon the minds of men or it is the most fantastic fact of history in other words the truthfulness of Christianity stands or falls on this one particular issue. Did Christ, was Christ resurrected? So how do we prove that there was a physical resurrection? You know, in our court system today that we have, you have testimony by witnesses um, or by various people They might testify about circumstantial evidence, you know, some type of evidence that they've tested and tried. But there is a tremendous amount of weight given to someone that testifies that's an eyewitness to an event. So, (coughs) in those times, we know that the opposition counsel will their job is to grill and to sandpaper those witnesses that say they have an eyewitness to confirm or show evidence that the eyewitness was actually has actually seen what they purport to have seen in a court of law the eyewitnesses integrity or motive may be questioned The Bible tells us that after Christ's resurrection, He was visibly seen by an individual, Mary Magdalene. Jesus appeared before His disciples. And then on another occasion, Jesus was seen by more than 500 followers. So there's quite a few eyewitnesses to Christ. Those eyewitnesses' testimony was accurate and real. There is no doubt in what they saw. It's recorded in history. Jesus truly resurrected from the dead. Well, there are at least two different accounts of Christ's appearance after His resurrection wherein that His wounds are mentioned. His hands and His feet and His side. Have you ever thought about why Christ's resurrected body would still show signs of those wounds? Jesus healed the sick. Jesus calls the blind to see. He made the lame to walk again. He mended broken hearts. He even raised the dead. 
Christ could have made those wounds disappear so that there was no evidence of the cross and what He went through physically for you and me. However, the, the Holy Scripture is, is very specific in that it tells us that His resurrected, glorified body still bore the marks of the mauling that he, he experienced, the gashes caused by the, the, the uh, whips that he was whipped by, and then also the thrusting of the spear in his side. We'll get more into that in a little bit. But we find in, in the 24th chapter of Luke, we're going to start with the 13th verse. And you know this story well. It's about the two disciples that were on the road to Emmaus. And Christ joins them unbeknownst to them. This, of course, was after Christ's resurrection. Um, one of the men was uh, Cleopas. Uh, it doesn't really say who the other one is. So I'm going to read verses 13 through 26, and then we'll jump back and, and talk about some of these verses. Verse 13 says, Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to the village called Maus, which is which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all the things which had happened. So it was, while they were conversed and reasoned, that Jesus himself drew near and went to them. But their eyes were restrained, so they did not know him. He said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one and another? So you walk as you walk and are sad. Then the one whose name was uh, Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there these days? And he said to them, What things? So they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth who was a prophet, mighty in deeds and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucify him. But we were hoping that he was who, we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and a certain woman of our company who arrived at the term tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that he had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. And then he said to them, O foolish ones, slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken? Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? The disciples didn't recognize Jesus when he joined them on the road to Emmaus. However, Jesus certainly recognized the sorrow, the sadness, and he asked them about it. He said, what's going on? Why are you so sad? Why are you talking about these things? And so Cleopas says, hey man, where have you been? Don't you know what's going on in Jerusalem? Where have you been the last week? The, everyone in Jerusalem knew about the crucifixion of Jesus. We see in verse uh, 19, that Jesus continues to play a little ignorant of the events that had transpired, asking what events you're talking about. So they recounted all the event, events that had taken place. 
and uh, they they told Jesus that they thought that Jesus was really the Messiah, the one that was going to deliver them. Uh, yet the the religious leaders had crucified him, and they explained that it had been three days, and that J, uh, Jesus had been been laid in a tomb, and yet when the women went early that morning to to do the ritual for the body. They found that the the tomb was empty. Um, the women had come back to them and told them of how the angel had angels had told them that that uh, Jesus was alive. That they were to go tell the disciples. Um, you know these these two disciples that were going to Emmaus had um, a lot of doubt. They had seen the crucifixion, but they were having difficulty believing that Jesus was alive. Notice what Jesus says to the men, two men in, in verses twenty five and twenty six. He makes a reference to his passion or suffering as well as his glory. Notice that how he puts his, his suffering in the past tense. Ought not Christ to have suffered? In other words, it, it had happened, hadn't it? So, Dr. Vines goes through in our lesson various types of wounds that can be administered to the human uh, human body. Uh, a contusion is a wound inflicted by a blunt instrument when the soldiers took their fist and beat the face of the Lord Jesus Christ um, until the Bible says he was not even recognizable as a man. Then there's the wounds of penetration made by a sharp instrument. The soldiers placed a crown of thorns on the head of Christ in mockery of Jesus as King. And then we know the wounds of lacerations, which are made by tearing instruments such as a whip. Pilate had ordered, ordered the, the beating of Christ. You remember that he was to, to have 40 lashes save one because they thought if they lash him the 40th time, that he would surely die. So they didn't want him to die. The wounds of uh, preparation are made by a piercing instrument, such as a nail in his hands and feet. A wound of incision made by a sharp-edged instrument, a spear into the side of Christ. All five of these types of wounds in Christ's case have been ended. There's no more wounds. Okay? Christ's statement in verse 26 says, Ought not Christ to have suffered? Jesus was saying to those two disciples there, as well as us today, that the miseries of His passion were ended. There are no more after His resurrection. However, there is one way that the sufferings of Christ will continue. Hebrews 2.17 says, Therefore in all things He had to be made like His brethren that He might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of, me, of people. Christ is our, as, as a believer, He's our high priest, which means that Christ is touched with feelings of our infirmities. He's, he understands and knows what ailments and weaknesses that we have. So what does this mean to you and me today? The implication is, is that Christ Jesus enters into our passion no matter the pain, the sorrow, or the heartache we endure, the glorified wounds of the Lord Jesus Christ mean that He understands everything we go through. 
Isaiah 53, 5 says, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. There are times that God heals physically. We know that. However, this verse here is telling us that your and my final healing, the victory over death, if we perish before Christ returns, then that final healing comes when a believer departs this old world and enters into his heavenly home. I, I truly believe that Christ could return any day, any moment. And should that be, while you and I are still alive, when Jesus returns for His bride, our final healing will occur in that twinkling of an eye. Won't that be wonderful? Well, then we see in verses 27 through 43, the marks of His passion are evidence. So, remember I talked about in a court of law, there's evidence, there's eyewitnesses, there's circumstantial evidence and all, but we're going to look and test the evidence. Let's, so we're going to look back at the marks of the wounds on, on the Lord Jesus Christ. They s serve at least two purposes. They're evidence that He really died on a cross, and their evidence that he rose again <coughs> from the dead and is alive, alive today. In verse 27, the scripture indicates that Jesus provided uh, the disciples, those two that he walked with, a lesson from the Old Testament. And then in verses 30 and 31, Christ revealed himself to the to the disciples so let's let's read 27 through 31 it says and beginning at Moses and all the prophets he being Jesus expounded on to them in all the uh, scriptures the things concerning himself then they drew near to the village where they were going and he indicated that he would be going further further They, they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now verse 30 says, Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with him, he took the bread, blessed and broke it, and he gave it to them. Verse 31 says, their eyes were opened and they knew Him. They knew it was Christ. And then it says, He vanished from their sight. Can you imagine these two disciples? The, the Scripture doesn't say whether or not they were in a group at that prior to this time that they saw Christ. Remember, this is the day that Christ arose. So we don't, we don't know if, if they had been privy to seeing Christ before this time. But you know that they had to be excited. They were probably a little fearful. Let's, let's read on. Verse 32 says, And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while He talked with us on the road and while He opened the Scriptures to us? Then verse 33 tells us about their excitement. It says, So they rose up that very hour. Now remember when Christ broke the bread, and, or he, he took the bread, he, bl he blessed it, He broke it, and they immediately recognized Christ. It says in verse 33, So they rose up that very hour, and return back to Jerusalem. Remember in the scripture that 
that we read. Um, uh, where is it? Oh, verse 29. He says, They constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. So it was apparently fairly late in the day. But yet verse 33 says that they arose up that very hour. I, I think that means immediately. And they returned to, to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those uh, who were with them gathered together. They said to, in verse 34 it says, The Lord is risen indeed. He has appeared to Simon. Now it's questionable who said the Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. The commentaries that I looked at seem to agree that these two disciples that had returned from Emmaus uttered these words as confirmation of the stories that, that they had been told from earlier that day. Uh, you know, the, the believers... The disciples ran to the tomb. It was empty. The information had been given by the angel and in the garden there. Nevertheless, here we find in verse 35, they tell everyone that uh, what happened while on the road and how when Christ broke the bread, uh, they realized it was the Christ. You know, I'm sure uh, the 11 disciples were just a little envious of these two disciples. Um, verse 36 tells us as, as soon as the story had been told, Jesus appears in their midst and He says, Peace to you. Verses 35, let me just read them, 35 and 36. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how He was known to them in breaking of bread. Now, as the, they said these things, Jesus stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. Now, you recall that Peter and, and another disciple raced to the tomb to find it empty. They did not know what to make of it, of course. Now that, that they had gathered together in this secret place in fear of the religious leaders, all of a sudden Jesus appears in their midst. What would your reaction be? I imagine that we would be just as terrified and frightened as those disciples were. They thought they had seen a spirit. That they had seen, you know, they had seen him, they witnessed him die. Yet now they saw him. Let's read 30, 30 verses 37 and 38. Because um, Jesus asked them, Why are you troubled? It says in, in verses 37 and 38. But they were terrified and frightened and suppo supposed they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your heart? Then we come back to verse 39 where it talks about the wounds on the body of Christ. Take, they really take center stage here. The evidence is out in the open for them not only to see, but Jesus tells them to touch Him. He was flesh and bones just like any other man. He was not a ghostly spirit that had returned from the grave to haunt them. Uh, as a skilled attorney would do, Jesus had built the evidence of proof for his case and the fact that he was alive after three days in the grave. They all had witnessed the, the infliction of the wounds upon Christ's body. Now the body that was before him had those same wounds, yet that was not enough to cause them to believe Jesus had risen. Let's look at, at, at verses... Um, um, well, let me... I didn't read 39 and 40, and then we'll jump to 41. 
It says, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me, see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Here's verse 41. But while they still did not believe for joy, they did marvel. He said to them, Have you any food here? So Christ said, Here I am. Here's the wounds on my body. They still had difficulty believing, thinking He was a spirit. And He says, Do you have anything to eat here? Verse 42 says, So they gave Him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb. And He took it and He ate in their presence. Well, guess what? If he had been a, a spirit, ghostly spirit, then he would have no reason for such uh, for food for sustenance. He, you know, they're just not. He wouldn't need it. So we see that Jesus perceives their skepticism here. So what's he do? He asked for something to, eat, to prove that he, um, and he ate in their presence, that he was more than just a spirit. Um, basically, Jesus got down on the discipleship's level. It's what he does with you and me. He doesn't talk over our heads. He doesn't challenge us over our heads, but right where we live. Uh, John writes about this experience in 1 John verse 1, 1. John says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our, and our hands have handled, of the word of life. John uses the term, have handled, is the same words that Jesus uses in Luke 24 where He says, Handle me. Were the disciples convinced that Christ had risen? They absolutely were now. They had been given the evidence of the wounds on His body. Then the proof, when they felt of those things, that He, wasn't, he, he was flesh and bones, and then the fact that he wasn't a spirit because he ate food, they believed. They absolutely did believe. How do we know that they believed? If you read in Acts, in the days to come, they were willing to give their own lives for the gospel of Christ. In fact, each one of, uh, with the exception of John, died a martyr's death. Uh, I did a little, little research here, and this is supposedly how all the disciples died, and Paul is included in this group. Uh, both Peter and Paul were martyred in Rome about 66 AD during the persecution under Emperor Nero. Paul was beheaded. Peter was crucified upside down at his own request since he did not feel he was worthy to, to die in the same manner as the Lord. Uh, uh, Andrew uh, went to the land of the man-eaters, which is now the Soviet Union. Christians were uh, there claimed he was the first to bring the gospel to their land. He also preached in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey and Greece, where he is said to have been crucified. Thomas was probably most active in the area east of Syria. Tradition has him preaching as far as east as India, of, as India where the ancient uh, Martha Holman Christians revered him as their founder. They claim that he died there when pierced with 
the spears of four soldiers. Philip um, possibly had a powerful ministry in Carthage in North Africa and then in Asia Minor where he converted the wife of a, a Roman proconsul. In retaliation, the proconsul had Philip arrested and cruelly put to death. Matthew, which, who was a tax collector and a writer of one of the gospel, ministered in Persia and Ethiopia. Ethiopia. Some of the oldest reports say that he was not martyred, while others say he was stabbed to death while in Ethiopia. Ethiopia. Bartholomew had widespread missionary travels uh, attributed to him by tradition to India with Thomas back to Armenia and also to, also to Ethiopia and South uh, Arabia. There are various accounts of how he met his death as a martyr for the gospel. This, um, James, uh, the son of Alphaeus, is one of the at least three James. James is referred to in the New Testament. There are some confusion as to which one is which, but this James is reckoned to have ministered in Syria. The Jewish historian Jehoshaphat, Jehophus reported that he was stoned and then clubbed to death. Simon, the ze uh, zealot, the story goes he ministered in Persia and was killed after refusing to sacrifice to the sun god. Uh, Matthias, the apostle chosen to replace Judas. Tradition sends him to Syria with Andrew and to death by burning. John, the only apostle generally thought to have died of natural death from old age. He was the leader in the church in Ephesus area and is said to have taken care of Mary, the mother of, of Jesus. Uh, there was persecutions in the mid-90s AD. He was exiled to the island of Patmos, where he is, is there he was uh, credited with the writing of the last book of the New Testament, of course, the Revelation. Um, in an early Latin tradition has him escaping unhurt after being cast into boiling oil at Rome. So we see that these, these apostles did believe in the risen Savior and that just as Christ was horribly beaten and then crucified, they, f they met the same demise in one form of another except for perhaps John. John was the only one that they say died of old, of natural causes due to being old. Um, so, Jesus' resurrected body was interesting to say the least. There are spiritual aspects to his body. He was able to transcend solid objects such as doors and walls. Over in Acts 1 and in verse 51 of this chapter we're in in Luke, Christ is taken up. He's ascends, he ascends into the heavens. And then there was a, a, the material aspects of Christ's resurrected body. He ate. That's what, what we just read about. He ate the, the fish and the honeycomb. John 20, 24 tells us that Thomas wasn't present when Christ appeared to the other disciples. When the disciples tell Thomas what happened, Thomas, you know the, what he says. He says, I, unless I see his hands and feel the prints of the nails thrust my hand into his side um, he wouldn't believe he, Thomas is basically saying 
I need some evidence, some proof. So we know what happened. About eight days later, the disciples were gathered together again. Thomas was with them this time. The doors are closed and Christ appears among them once again. Christ tells Thomas to touch him for the needed proof that Thomas required. Thomas's response was immediate. He said, My Lord and my God, Thomas sees and believes there was really no need to touch. Then we see in, in verses 29 of John 20, Jesus says to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen yet have believed. You know, basically, when Jesus addresses Thomas here, he's referring to every believer since the first century to current day. Jesus is referring to you and me. We have not seen Jesus uh, with our physical eyes, yet we believe and we're blessed for that. Then we come to the last two verses of today's lesson, which is verses 50 and 51. Uh, the section is entitled, The Messages of His Passion Are Eternal. Jesus gets ready to return to heaven. So let's look and see what verses 50 and 51 have to say. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass, while he blessed them, that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. John, the revelator, says in, in chapter um, 5, Verses 1 through 6, John records what he sees. And it says, And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaim with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll to look at it. John says, So I wept much because no one could find, be found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And John says, And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God unto uh, sent out unto all the earth. And this slain lamb, this lamb, came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sits on the throne. How did John know that it was a lamb as if it had been slain? What does it say up there? Um... Verse 6 it says, And uh, stood a lamb as though it had been slain. How did John know that? It's because he had seen the evidence of the, the wounds on the resurrected, glorified body of the Lord Jesus. This means that Easter is a message of His eternal work. 
when we get to heaven, His eternal work will be manifested in His wounds. The Bible tells that when He returned to heaven, He sat down at the right hand of God the Father and that He's praying for you and me. One reason is because the Bible says that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. We can only imagine that Satan, uh, what Satan has to say to God the Father when we sin. But if he does accuse us, Jesus Christ only has to show his wounds and say, I paid the price for those sins. The devil has to flee before the wounds of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a story that um, Dr. Vines put in the lesson I thought was just really, really super. And, um, you know, when, when soldiers are wounded in battle in defense of their country, we give, we give them special honor and recognition. That is because the wounds have, uh, have become tokens of honor. There is a story told from, from the Civil War about a man named General John Gordon. After the war was over, he was running for the Senate seat for South Carolina. The legislature had to nominate him. But in that legislature was a soldier who, had, who for some reason had developed a grudge against the, the general. The soldier decided he was going to embarrass General Gordon by voting against him. As the votes were being taken, this gruntled soldier stood up and cast his ballot. ballot. He looked over and saw a battle scar on the side of General Gordon's face. Instead of casting his vote, as he planned against General Gordon, the soldier sat down and began to weep. Through the tears, he said, I can't do it. I had forgotten the scar. If the soldier's battle scars can evoke such passion, this soldier, this general that fought, if, it, if that soldier's battle scars can evoke so much passion, how much more should Jesus' scars affect you and me? If it weren't for those scars, we would have no hope of eternal life. That's what it's all about. That's what it's always been about. Because God made a way for us to be reconciled to Him even long before man was even created. Oh, what a Savior He is. I, I tell you, and we're, the Sunday we get to, to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. I don't know about you, but that's, that's a special time to me. And I'm just so thankful that we have a loving Savior that is willing, was willing to come as a baby, to grow up and to be crucified in the prime of His life. To allow you and me the opportunity of eternal salvation. As the songwriter says, and I've already said it, oh, what a Savior. Praise His name. Well, I hope to see you in, in uh, Sunday school this week. As you know, we're doing, we're, we're actually in class. If you can make it, that'd be wonderful. I pray that you will. Um, we do have social distancing and, and everything, so uh, come join us. And uh, if you don't join us, just certainly pray for us. 
and lift us up and uh, we'll lift you up likewise uh, we just need to continue to remember our our nation the individuals that are sick sick whether it be physical or spiritually we just need to lift them up we know that sometimes people have trying weeks this week has been a trying week but praise the Lord he's still on the throne and he watches out and provides when the needs arise so let's go to the Lord in prayer we thank you Lord for your mercy last week we we learned about your mercy and your truth we thank you for both of those things Lord we don't know what we would do if we didn't have you therefore we just lift your name on high we exalt you Lord we worship you and honor you and Lord we do come with needs today that you would touch those that that have a physical need Lord whatever it may be or Lord they may have a a, a need of of a spiritual need that that they're lost physical need or just Lord maybe they're, they're just uh, the, depressed we just lift them up to you tonight Lord just be especially close to them and strengthen them in all that they do and say Lord we honor you we pray for our nation we pray for those leaders we ask for a great awakening a great revival and Lord we pray that you would just start it in us that we would not cow down yet we would speak boldly for your name's sake Lord we love you and we thank you for all you do for us it's in Jesus name I pray Amen well God bless you hope to see you Sunday love you guys Bye.